looked down and saw an evil place. The people did some wicked things, but weren't sorry for the waste. But Noah was a man with goodness in his heart. He would be God's chosen one to create a work of art. For God has said today, please start. It's time to build the ark. A floating zoo, just as God said to do. Flap, tap, bang, bang, Noah built the ark. Two by two, a floating zoo, just as God said to do. God said it will rain for forty days and nights. Blow two of every creature in and keep them in your sight. Lions and zebras too, birds and butterflies. Noah had to find two of them, no matter what the size. For Noah said the rain will start. It's time to get in the ark. Noah, Noah, Noah built the ark. Two by two, a floating zoo, just as I said to do. Rap, tap, bang, bang, Noah built the ark. Two by two, a floating zoo, just as God said to do. Then Noah looked up in the sky and saw a rainbow way up high. It was God's promise to you and me. No more floods, guaranteed. Noah, Noah, Noah built the ark. Two by two, a floating zoo. Just as God said to do. Rap, tap, bang, bang, Noah built the ark. Two by two, a floating zoo. Just as God said to do. Just as God said to do. Just as God said to do. That's right, children. Let us grow in the Lord together. Let's sing this. Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you grow, grow, grow. Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible. Good morning and welcome to Peace. Uh, it is such a blessing to get to see so many little ones here that are just sharing uh, their love for music and praising God. And parents, just thank you so much for investing in your kids uh, through Peace Preschool. Uh, so welcome uh, to Peace. We'd like to know that you're here and one way you can do that is just by filling out one of the connect cards in one of the black uh, folders at the end of the aisles. You can fill that out and let us know that you're here. Another way that you can do that 
is through the Church Center app. Uh, if you open up the Church Center app, you can click check in and you can sign in digitally that way. Um, I have one more announcement I'd like to share with you all. Uh, on November 1st at 6.30 p.m., um, we are having uh, an individual come and speak about the positivities that we can pour into our kids. Her name is Amy Hubick. She is a professor at Concordia University in Seward. And she's going to speak uh, on topics through, uh, through the experiences in uh, her life as a mother and then her research done as a clinical counselor. And so uh, we do these parent sessions every single year. We really try to invest in our, uh, in our families and our parents and give them uh, tools and resources. So I want to highly encourage you to come out for that. Again, it's Wednesday, November 1st at 6.30. It'll be right here in the Life Center. Well, at this time, we're going to sing. We're going to be praising God with a couple songs. Why don't we stand and let's greet those around us.
articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry and then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be confession. In our world today, people are in battle over land, over resources, over politics, and so much more. But we also know that there is a battle in each and every one of us, and it is one that we cannot win. God, though, sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that he may lead us through this battlefield. And so this morning, join me in a prayer of confession, and we'll use the words on the screen in response. We pray. Merciful God, the battle is all around us and we are surrounded by the enemy and by the sin within our own hearts. Lord, forgive us when we are paralyzed by confusion and doubt. Strengthen our faith that we may not only believe, but that we may be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to help and to heal. Be near us, O God, and grant us your mercy and grace. 
When others sin against us, help us to be forgiving and grace-filled. When we have harmed others, Lord, lead us to humbly seek their forgiveness as we seek yours. Be near us, O God, and grant us your mercy. Lord, grant us the courage to accept those things that we cannot change, that we may be freed from anger and resentment. God, forgive us when our disappointment clouds our wisdom and it confuses our actions. Be near us, O God, and grant us your mercy and grace. Lord, guide us on this path of ministry in the battle for the lost, that we may be filled with your joy and the joy as we serve in your name. And for the sake of Jesus, your son, forgive us. Amen. Now, God's grace is sufficient for all our needs, covering all of our sin. God's power is made perfect in our weakness as Christ redeems our lives, and he reconciles us fully and completely to him. Amen. You may be seated. So with the Peace, uh, Peace Preschool kids that we had this morning, we just want to say thank you all for your support for uh, the Peace Preschool ministry. Um, uh, it, it is led by our amazing director, Mrs. Deanne Dupler. Uh, the preschool has 122 students that come here every single week. Uh, we've also been uh, kind of chosen as the best in GI again this year, which is always just great to, to see. Uh, one other a notification that we got was that we have been reaccredited by the National Lutheran Schools Association, and so that is amazing to, uh, to hear. Uh, two things that we did this past year uh, for Peace Preschool is we were able to update the playground surface, uh, and then we also were able to update the hallways and repaint all those. Uh, Peace Preschool is, uh, is a ministry that has been a part of Peace for 40 years, and we are so thankful for the support that you all um, uh, give to that for the families uh, that invest in your children each and every uh, day, bringing your kids here. So thank you for that. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward, and we'll receive our offering.
have all the kids to come on up to the steps here for the kids' message. Come on down, he needs to be petted, yes, that's, there you go, all right, there we go. Boy, it's nice to see you guys today. Anybody get cold last night? You did? Really? Yeah, it got kind of cold, didn't it? Well, I was going to tell you a little bit about Eddie. Did you guys know he's been all over the United States to different things? But what I wanted to tell you about today was when we went to Friday. You know, Friday we got a call, I guess I'd say the week before, from the Grand Generation Center. And guess who was going to be at the Grand Generation Center? The University of Nebraska Cheerleaders and Herbie Husker. They wanted to see Eddie. And it was pretty neat, you know, they were jumping up and down and all that stuff, and it was, it was great. But Jerry went with me, and Jerry was taking Eddie around to see everybody, and as he was going, he was handing out, you know, Eddie has business cards, you know, you've all seen them, I mean, it's got his picture on the front, do you guys remember that? And then on the back, it, it tells about Eddie and what he does in his Facebook page. And Eddie and Jerry was going around, and he was handing these cards out. And then he got to this one lady, and she wouldn't take the card. And then Jerry took Eddie a little closer to her, and she ran away. She, I don't know, she was scared of Eddie. And I, I, you guys have an idea, why would somebody be as scared of Eddie? Are, are you guys scared of Eddie? No. I don't know. Is anybody out here scared of Eddie? No. See? No. Why, why do you suppose she was scared of Eddie? Because she probably knew. Yeah, she probably knew. Well, you know, I got to think, maybe, uh, do, do you suppose that when she was a little girl, a dog bit her? Or maybe when she was a little girl, a dog chased her? Or as, as one kid said earlier in the service here, one of the earlier services, he said, maybe she just liked cats. <laughs> I don't know, but, you know, I was, was kind of concerned. But, you know, it's one of those things that uh, not everybody likes the same thing. And it's just like, you know, pastor's going to talk a little about react or response, what God did with, in Mark here with the people. But I got to thinking, you know, how would people respond if... Uh, What's it say on, on Eddie's vest for his name? It says Eddie, doesn't it? Would, would people look different at him if I, what if I put a new tag on her and said, killer? <laughs> or what's the other thing it says? It says, please pet me. What if I put on her, pet at your own risk? <laughs> or if people came up to me, and I, I'd tell them, stay at least 10 feet away. You know, that would probably give people a different impression of Eddie, too. So a lot of times it's a way we respond to people. But what I really wanted to say is you guys grow up or in school, do you know some kids that don't know Jesus? Say, buddy, I bet we do. But what I was just going to say is when you run into those kids, you know, be nice and share about Jesus, how he loves them and all that stuff, because... They're not, may not be as lucky as you because they didn't grow up with a, a family that maybe knew Jesus. So just remember, we're all responsible for everybody else. But let's close here with a prayer, okay? All right, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the many blessings you've given us. And most importantly, dear Lord, I just ask, I really ask that thy will be done. And in your name we pray, amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. Thanks, guys.
The scripture reading this morning is from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. This, this is, is the, the word, word of the, the Lord. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning. Good morning, Brother Eddie. They always tell me this church is going to the dogs. Well, this is one good dog down here. Killer, did you say killer? No one would believe that ever, right? Um, this morning I've got a little figurine. I don't expect you to see it, but um, basically I get this out every year about this time of year. It's a, a man, he's wearing all purple, he's bent over. He obviously has a crown of thorns on his head and he is carrying a great big cross. And this doesn't take you long to figure out this is a figurine of who? Of, of Jesus Christ, right? Carrying that cross. Uh, if you were living in Central America, you'd have a little bit different name for it. Uh, the name, I'll put it on the screen for you. It is called El Cristo Negro de Escuepalas. Just turn to your neighbor and say Escuepalas. Yeah, probably, maybe not, right? Um, there's a lot of legend behind this little figurine. Actually, the larger version of it kind of goes to the idea that there was a Portuguese uh, artist who was commissioned by a church in Spain to create the big size of this. And the idea behind the Negro Cristo is that, that Jesus is a God who really serves, in particular, those who are poor and outcast, those who are, who are hungry for him. Well, as the legend goes, he made the, the statue. They put it on a boat. It began to sail for Spain. The boat sunk, and everybody said, the statue's gone. But it was not. It was discovered in a cave and brought it out of the cave and then brought into the church in Spain. And the idea is every year, in most Central Latin countries, they'll take El Cristo Negro out, uh, the large version of it, and they'll literally march it down the streets. I had an opportunity to watch this happen in Peru. And uh, the beautiful thing is you have people by the tens of thousands who just press in on each other, and they are starved to just, I just want to touch I just want to put my hand on that cross. Of course, we, we know, you know, I know that a, an inanimate object cannot heal you, but the people are so hungry just to see Jesus. And it makes me pull back, and I, I often think about this, of what it means for you and I to, to see Jesus. What does it mean to see Jesus, to be hungry for him, to say, Lord, I, I want to be with you. I want to I want to raise that question up as we turn to Mark chapter 6 this morning. We have a number of you who are guests. Let me just tell you what we're doing. We are walking through the gospel of Mark, one chapter a week. We'll be in Mark till Christmas. There are 16 chapters. But the purpose of it is to actually take hold of all of these stories that are part of the gospel and realize that, that each of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all tell the story of Jesus, but they all have a little bit of a different and more specific message that the stories go together to form. So when we study the gospel of Mark, the thing that I like to ask people is, why, why is Mark writing this gospel? What's his purpose? What's the one message? A lot of different stories. Feed the 5,000, heal the sick, preach, preach from the mount. But, but if you put them all together, what is the one message that Mark is trying to deliver? And if you've been with us by now, I'm hoping it's starting to sink in. We're recognizing that the gospel of Mark is about a battle, a war, that is going on for the souls of men. Now, if you haven't heard of this morning yet, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but there's more news from Israel. Israel last night was fired upon more rocket fire, not by Hamas. The rocket fire came out of Lebanon. Hezbollah has engaged. 
war experts are standing back and they're asking the question, what about Iran? Because by the hundreds of thousands, Iranians are gathering together in protest of the war. And there are many who are beginning to say, we may be witnessing the beginning of World War III. That scares every one of us in this room. But it should not scare you to the degree of the battle that Jesus is talking about in this gospel. I don't know if you remember this, but Matthew in the 10th chapter says this, do not fear those who are able to kill the body. We're all going to die. Rather, fear he who is able to kill both body and soul in hell. And the reality of it is, over the last number of weeks, I've asked you to, to think about someone in your life. Could be a son, could be a daughter. I've had people say to me, it's my wife, or it's my husband, or it's my dad, or it's my grandchild, whose souls right now are in danger. And Jesus is saying, let's go to war. And in that war, our weapon is the word of God. Is it powerful? Is it powerful? Yeah, it's powerful. I don't know if you remember this, but where Mark chapter 5 leaves off is Jesus walks into a room. There's a little girl. She is dead. She is lying dead on a bed. The first words out of Jesus' mouth, this is at the end of Mark 5. Jesus looks at the little girl and says, she is not dead. She's only sleeping. Everybody in the room goes, ha, 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 right. Remember what Jesus does? Get out. All you who just laughed, get out of the room. I do not want unfaith in this room. And they walk out of the room and Jesus speaks two words. He looks at the little girl and he says, Talatikumi. And the little girl gets up and breath is in her lungs and she's alive. Is the word of God powerful? Well, we know that the word of God is powerful, but I want to put a little twist on that this morning as we enter into chapter six. Pastor Luke, is, is the word of God powerful? Is the word of God powerful? Absolutely, it is powerful. But here's my question. Is its power absolute? Let that sink in for a minute. I mean, we, we all know that, that the word of God is, is powerful. We see it. We read the Bible. God, at the very beginning of the book, says, let there be light, and light must obey. God says, let the Red Sea be torn in two, and the Red Sea must be torn in two. God says, let there be manna on the ground, and there is manna on the ground. Deuteronomy chapter 7, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. God even con controls and commands hornets. Do you guys remember this? Look it up. It's a fun story. Hornets to attack the enemies. They've got guns and bows, and they're like, oh, what are these? They sting them to death. He controls the hornets, for goodness sakes. He says to the lame man in the New Testament, you stand up and walk. You see. You speak. Is the word of God, I mean, we know it's absolutely power, but is its power absolutely? What I mean by that is, must all of heaven and that which is on earth and that which is under the earth, must they all obey the word of God? And we want to say yes. Of course. Then comes chapter six. Do you remember what happened to the word? I think, you'll, I think you'll remember the, the story of me, Jesus. I'll, I'll put these verses. We're going to go verses 1 to 3. Jesus is, is going back to his hometown. The, the text simply reads, he went away from there, and he came to his hometown. Get that map in your mind. You've been looking at it a lot. We're on the West Bank. We're not on the Gaza Strip. Go to the other side. Here's Bethlehem. Here's Nazareth. They're about 70 miles apart. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Remember that he grew up in Nazareth. So he's going home. He's going to Nazareth. The disciples are going with him, and they're excited because this will be probably the first time that the people back home get to embrace Jesus as the Messiah. But what happens? Pay attention. It says, he began, verse 2, to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, and they begin asking questions. My contention is, quite often these words are read with the wrong inflection. We, we want to kind of put these people standing back, looking at Jesus, saying, oh, oh, where did he get these wonderful things? Where did he get this wisdom? How is he able to do these things? That's not true. 
Here, here's what it sounds like. Where did he get this? What kind of wisdom is this? And, and how is he pulling off this stuff? Isn't he, notice they begin to ask the questions. Isn't, isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't he the son of Mary, the brother of James, and, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Aren't these the sisters that are here with us? Notice these very next words. It says, and they took offense at him. In the Greek language, the word for offense comes from the verb skenlizo. We get our English word scandal from it. What it's telling us is that they scandalized Jesus. They looked at him and said, well, you're a scandal. What, what a shame you are. You come here pretending to be some wise teacher, and what begins to happen is they begin to take the word of God. Is the word of God powerful? Absolutely. But is, it, is its power absolute? They begin to push back against the word of God. And I want you to notice verse number five, these very next words. Let's read it together. Just read it with me. It says, and he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. I want you to really get that first part into your mind. And he could do no mighty works there. Do you know why? Unbelief. Get out of the room. I'm going to heal this girl. It's like a door slamming shut against the word of God that wants to come into you and bring you joy and bring you peace and bring you healing. I don't want it. Bam! And we are able to look at this text and we say, these people that should have embraced Jesus instead push him away. But do we? What I want to walk through with you this morning so that we don't leave this text simply otherizing another group of people are three obstacles that I believe sometimes you and I put in the way of the Word of God. And the first obstacle is I think there are times when, when we begin to question the Word of God or we become cynical about it. We, we, we begin to ask God questions. Are you real? Are you there? Do you, do you really answer prayer? Why did you allow this to happen in my life? We begin to question God. And what happens? He was not able to work any miracles there. We begin to close the door on the very things God is trying to do in our lives. I don't know if you remember this, but James, in his little epistle, chapter 1 says it this way. I'm not going to put this on the screen, so listen to me. He says it this way. He says, when you pray, do not doubt. For he who doubts is like the waves of the sea tossed here and there. Listen to these next words. Let not that person believe that they will receive anything from the Lord. Bam. Unbelief. Doubt. Cynicism shuts the door on a word that wants to work in us. Is God's word powerful? Absolutely. Is its power absolute? Do you know that God has given you the power to shut that door on the word of God? The second obstacle that we often put in front of the word is very simply this, is we are unwilling to surrender to what God is trying to do in our lives. You ever done this before? You come to God, and you're like, God, I've got this need. It's, oh, it's a mighty need, God. And I know that only you, the Lord God of the universe, are able to, 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 to answer this question. Lord, I'm going to put this into your hand, Lord. Hold out your hand, Lord. Thank you. Here, take this. Oh. You take it back? You ever done that? You don't let it go. This is a terrible example, but I'm going to, I'm going to use it anyway. Um, <laughs> How many of you remember the name O.J. Simpson? I want to see hands. Don't leave me up here by myself. Come on. Yeah. Can you remember where you were the day, the Ford Bronco, the police? Can you remember where you were that day? I, I was in Florida with, with Ann. We were visiting her parents. 
here goes OJ in that Ford Bronco. It's so embarrassed the Ford Motor Company that they stopped making Broncos for decades, right? It was terrible. But it was horrible television. They got all the television shows off. They had have, they have this Bronco driving and police driving behind them, except in Florida, they had another story that they cut away to. This guy had gone fishing. And he caught his dream, dream fish. He caught a marlin. It's a big fish, three to 500 pound fish. He caught the marlin. The only problem is the marlin pulled him out of the boat and into the water. Top quiz for you guys this morning. When a 500 pound fish pulls you out of the water and into the boat, what is the first thing you should do? Help me out, guys. Let go of the rod. Did he let go of the rod? No. He's like, they're like, here's OJ. Woo! I'm like, this is a bad, bad day for television, right? It's not good. But you know, we do it. We're like, oh God, God, I'm coming to you, Lord. I have this need here, 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 Lord, take it. Whoop. We hold on to it. You know what it's doing? It's killing you. It's pulling you under, sucking the joy out of your life, removing you from the very peace God's word wants to bring into you. And we hold on to this stuff, and God the whole time is yelling, let go, and let me do what I do. Would you just let go? And sometimes, last thought, the obstacle is just a broken heart. We lose heart. And I'm not going to pretend this morning because I, I know this is true that there are people walking into this room today and you're really close to just losing heart, giving up, you're giving up on God. And he sees you. He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. And I truly believe that the most important words in this entire chapter, they occur in verse number 50, as Jesus looks out at his disciples and he says, two words, take heart. Take heart. Don't give up. I'm with you. I won't pretend to know what's going on in your life, but I do know this. There's a lot of people, because I've talked to you over the last few weeks, who are saying to me, there's a lot of hard stuff going on in our family, our extended family. Don't hold on to it. Just put it in God's hands. Don't give up. Take heart. Because God wants to bring a word into your life that will bring you peace despite in the face of the troubles that we find ourselves in. A word that embraces you and reminds you that he is in control and that he loves you deeply. In Jesus Christ, this morning, my words to you are very simple. Take heart in him. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to do a little bit of a baptism time, so Josh, Kayla, come on up here. I think you better bring uh, Lily up here. We're going to try something a little different. We're coming over to this little baptism font. Um, you guys can't see this, but we've, we've got the Sea of Galilee right here. It kind of flows down, and the sea comes down here, all the way down through the Dead Sea, Sea of Capernaum. We got the whole thing up here, but the most important thing we have is little water and a little goldfish up in here for uh, Lily. Lily Elaine, how are you doing this morning? <laughs> so how did we come up with Lily? How did you guys pick that out? We just liked it. You like Lily? Yeah, Elaine I kinda is like mom's middle name. Elena's yeah. mom? Yes. Your, that's your middle name? Mm -hmm. And you're gonna share that with, with little Lily. That's pretty awesome. And how about the outfit? Is it new or is it? It's my mom's wedding dress. She had it made. You wore this thing for your wedding? Like a part of it, right? Like a little part of it, okay. Lily Elaine, you have no idea what's happening to you, but I'm gonna tell you right now, you are absolutely beautiful, and we're gonna make the sign of the cross on your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. You're gonna be a singer in our choir, I can tell already. I know it's true. So, well, one of the things we like to do is, is sponsors. You guys have, a, have a, a mighty awesome job. So tell me if I say this, is it Kyla? Yeah, Kyla and Mackenzie. All right, so your sponsors, we just ask that you pray for Lily. 
reminder of her baptism, kind of help mom and dad. And uh, we also kind of ask you to do a few other little small things. But let me ask you first, can you do all of that? Then answer yes with the help of God. Yes, with the help of God. Okay. And the other part in here, I hate to read this to you, but it says you're to supply Lily with her college education fund and her first, yes, with the help of God, and her first Ford F-150, and we don't want the electric kind. All right? Amen. Amen. So, Josh and Kayla, what a great privilege for me to be able to do this. Lily's growing up in a great home, and we picked a verse for her right out of 2 Corinthians 5. It's my favorite chapter of the Bible, and it simply says, we walk by faith, not by sight. And I, I want to give that verse to Lily because she will walk by faith throughout her days. And you guys get the privilege of helping her grow up to know all these characters in the Bible. And I, I am thrilled for you and with you. All right, let's get Lily over the water. Miss Lily, yeah, you are beautiful. <laughs> yes, there's, there's a lot of dress over here. What are you looking at over here, girl? You want to come over here a little bit? There we go, girl. And Miss Lily Elaine Church. On this day, I, I know, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Hey, oh, I know. Why do they do these things to me? Yeah. There I go. There's a mama. There's a mama. Oh, you're gorgeous. I'm going to say a prayer over you, and then we're going to welcome Lily into the church. Lord God, what a great day. I want to just give you thanks for a little girl who maybe she will be in the choir. I don't know, but I do know this. You're going to walk with her through life, Lord. You will be her strength, her guide, her savior. Lord, bless her in a mighty way, we pray, along with the church family. Be with them. In Jesus' name, let's say it together. Amen. We've got a couple of things for you, a candle and a, a bab baptism reminder. But congregation, help me welcome this little girl into the Lord's family. You can do some pictures afterwards if you want to. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. There we go. Okay. In our prayers today, um, the first thing I want to do is just celebrate with you. We did get a, uh, an answer to a lot of prayers, and Pastor Justin Bangert and his family, Amanda, uh, their son AJ, their daughter Grace, have accepted our call and will be joining us here at Peace. And yes, you may clap for the Lord for that. Yeah. Yeah. Not sure a timetable. I know that uh, Amanda's a teacher, so she'll, she will be um, coming right after semester, so after Christmas time. He'll probably, Justin will probably come a little bit before that. But we'll work out all that stuff. I'm just thrilled that they'll be able to be here. We're praying for some people going in for surgery. Mary Watts, surgery on her neck. And then uh, Ricky Eads, a new knee. We're falling apart. Come on. Uh, but we're going to ask God, God's blessing on them, oh, along with just some health needs. Let's stand and go before the Lord in prayer. Father, it's a great day. This is your day. We came to worship you. Lord, the world is filled with some hard news right now. We'll turn on our TVs tonight. We'll hear about missiles and, and wars. But there's a bigger war going on, and it is a war for souls. Lord God, we're stepping onto the battlefield, and the weapon that we have is your word, and it is absolutely powerful. God, I pray that you work through everyone in this room to bring your word into this community, into our neighborhoods, into our families. Lord, let your word succeed, we pray. We're praying a prayer of thanksgiving for the Bankert family and for Pastor Justin coming and becoming a part of our family here at Peace. You've gifted him in some really beautiful ways. I can't wait to see his gifts unleashed as he becomes a part of the Peace family and this community. Lord, um, we're just going to pray over the situation in Israel. And uh, Lord, just recognize what's happening before our, our, our eyes. Hard to imagine the, the pain of death. Lord, uh, we, we do pray over families who have lost people. And uh, you've called us to even be people who pray, and we're going to, for even the souls of those who are deceived by Islam, who have been deceived into terrorism. 
Lord, give your word reign even in their lives, we would pray. And Lord, as we come before you, uh, we, we lift up those who have just physical needs. We pray for Mary, for Rick as they go in for surgery. We pray for those who are sick, struggling with health issues. And Lord, we just ask for your healing. There are many prayers in each one of our lives. We bring them here. We place them into your hands. We lift them up before Jesus, who together has taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance and give you what the world cannot give you, his peace in Jesus. See you.
next Sunday.